we're going to welcome our next guest speaker, also from uh, the CWC up. Got Mike Polito and for Mike's fun fact, he was part of a team of researchers that discovered a breeding colony of 1.5 million penguins in Antarctica. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today. I really appreciate it. And uh, today I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, one species. I'm going to talk about uh, how species interact and how we can, how understanding, having an understanding of how species interact can help us uh, tease apart uh, which individuals are more, individual species are more important than others. And I know that's a completely loaded word because importance is really in the eye of the beholder and in the, the question or issue you're trying to resolve. And we'll get into that as well. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the take-home messages. Uh, basically, what did, what did we do and, and what did we find out? And this is really summarizing um, a paper that was led by Mike McCann, who's, who was a, a postdoc in, in this larger group. Um, and lots of, lots of uh, co-authors who uh, were together at a, a workshop where this, this paper came out. Uh, but basically what we use is we use a food web model approach to predict the role of individual taxa or species in the overall response to uh, ecosystem response to a, you know, to a food web. So um, which species might be more, uh, might lead to stronger indirect or add-on effects that could cascade through a food web um, following an oil spill. Uh, what we ended up finding in this approach is that marsh fishes, and those are fishes both on the marsh platforms, creeks, and channels, as well as out in the open bays, they tend to um, be resilient uh, to oil spills and can lead to resiliency across the food web uh, because they're, they're highly connected in that food web. Where there's some other organisms such as water birds, that could be wading birds or gulls and terns and snails, um, which are also highly connected and important in the food web, but also much more sensitive and that they could be lead to a stabilization feature following an oil spill. So I'm going to walk you through three questions as we sort of talk about how this paper came about and, and, and the results we found. The first is I'm going to sort of go over and, and try to uh, define what a food web is. Uh, then we're going to tackle that idea of are some species more important in a food web than others? And then last, we're going to try to figure out are those important species also ones who are sensitive to oil. And so this is the framework that the group came, came up with, a very simple framework uh, to sort of a, to, to, uh, tackle this goal. You sort of have uh, one axis that has the importance an organism or, or, ta or a group of organisms may, may have in the food web, and another axis which is some sort of measure of the sensitivity of that group of, of, of organisms or, or, or species to oil. Uh, and so you could imagine that species that are very important in the food web and are very sensitive to oil spills, those are species that you might expect to see big impacts to their populations following an oil spill, that those impacts would also cascade through the food web and affect other species as well. Whereas species that are not very sensitive to the oil spill, to, to, to oil, but very important in, in the food web, those could be a stabilizing feature or, or, or groups that could lead to resilience. Uh, and then you have lots of other groups as well, right? So uh, this is the framework we came with. So uh, to sort of give you a little bit of background of what a food web is, um, we'll even take it a step uh, lower and we'll talk about food chains. So a food chain is basically uh, a, a succession of organisms that eat other organisms and are in turn eaten themselves, right? So you have the classic grass, uh, hare, and fox, you know, food chain. That, uh, that you might have learned about in elementary school. Well, a food web is just all of the different combinations of food chains that might exist in the ecosystem. So for instance, you can see this uh, little fish right here, might eat a grass shrimp, but then that fish could be eaten by a seabird, it could be eaten by a crab, could be eaten by a, a mammal. There's lots of individual food chains, and when you sort of connect them all together, you end up with a web or a network, a food web. And so this is a very simplistic uh, food web right here. We know that in, in reality, food webs are very, very complex. This is the food web that we created um, for this project. And it looks a lot more complex than the last one. But I can tell you, you know, once you see how the sausage is made, um, you see that there's still a lot of subjectivity in, in how you say group, 
organisms or separate them out, what data sources you use to figure out those connections. So the work we did here is we went through uh, and did a, a very large literature search for uh, dietary studies, mostly things like stomach content analysis. And we said, okay, any organism that eats another organism, we'll draw a line between them, right? And so every line here is saying that an organism either is eaten by, by the one it's connected to or, or eats the one it's connected to. Right, and then you have to make some assumptions about whether you should group a species, separate out species, these sorts of things. But this is the approach we use, and this is the sort of uh, coastal salt marsh, Louisiana salt marsh food web that we came up with. All right, so then how do you go from that network uh, of that food web to measuring importance, right? How do you get from that big mess to some sort of measure of importance? And there's lots of different ways you can do it, and, and, and how you do it may depend on the question you're trying to answer. In this approach, we sort of settled on this idea of how connected is an is a, uh, a organism or a group of organisms to other organisms, and how unique is it in its role, right? Uh, so for example, a little harder to see here, uh, but you can see some of these have red lines, and some of them have gray lines that you can't see. Uh, but basically, I've highlighted just a, a couple of different or, uh, groups, so dolphins, wading birds, gulls, terns, sparrows, the birds, and, 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 uh, and the marine mammal. Uh, and, and I've highlighted in red uh, the organisms that they're connected to. And so you can see some organisms, say sparrows, they're connected to a wide range of things, you know, vegetation, uh, to insects, to uh, in, uh, uh, Martian vertebrates, very well connected in, in there as well. Other organisms like dolphins, right, they're not connected to lots of things, but they occupy a very unique spot in that they're a top predator, and the things that they're connected to are connected to lots of other things as well. So um, you can basically use some of these different metrics of connectedness and uniqueness to sort of make a, a sliding scale of the importance of an organism, a group of organisms is in a food web. And so this is uh, kind of a summary of that. Uh, for now, I'm just going to show you this axis. And you can sort of say we have a food web importance and, and the scale is, uh, don't worry about the scale. All you need to know is at the higher end are the things that are more important, more either connected and or unique. And the things that are lower are the things that are less connected and or unique. Right, in this food web that we built, right? And you can see, you know, things that pop to the top, blue crabs, blue crabs won by, by a, a big measure. And basically, if you're in a Louisiana salt marsh, uh, you are either eaten by a blue crab or, or eat a blue crab or probably some combination of all of that. Um, but there's other organisms such as those uh, uh, marsh fishes, gulls, terns, snails, uh, marsh crabs, variety of things that sort of show up as being important and some things that are, that are less so in this measure. All right, so uh, the next question we have is, which organisms are sensitive to oil? And this is a challenging proposition, right? As all of you know, and as, as uh, Frank alerted, alluded to earlier in his talk, there's lots of ways to measure sensitivity. Um, for this study, we end up doing a literature review of studies that had looked at population level effects, right? Because uh, there's a lot of studies that look at individual organismal level effects, but oftentimes those are really hard to scale up to understanding uh, how a stressor, in this case oil, may affect an entire population. So we tried to find studies that had looked at population level effects from oil spills and extrapolated out through there in sort of a range, you know, from uh, things that didn't have much data, which was definitely eye-opening to see where our, our data gaps were as far as population level effects, to organisms that were more resilient at the population level to spills, to organisms that were less resilient or, or more sensitive to spills. And so, uh, as you can imagine, we can put, uh, show both of those axes and we kind of come up with that grid. And maybe it's not as, as beautiful as, as this, but you can kind of get that, that idea. We can look through these groups of species and we can try to figure out where are species that seem to be important in a food, in, in a food web model and where are species that tend to be sensitive to oil and where's that overlap? Okay. Um, and I'm going to walk you through some examples, kind of each box, and give you a couple different examples. So um, these were the species that sort of ended up in this critically sensitive box, or, or organisms that were important in the food web, but all, and also sensitive to stressors. Uh, for example, those water birds, and those are things like pelicans, gulls, terns, hair, uh, wading birds, uh, marsh periwinkles that, that Scott talked about, really important organism because uh, of their, their sort of uh, top-down and bottom-up sort of effects. They're, they're, they're important uh, in structuring the vegetation and the habitat, 
but also an important prey resource for lots of things. And so we would expect that if you were to see population level effects following still of these species, this is where you would most likely see them, and that these would be the species that would then have had on effects down the food web or up the food web. Um, species that uh, studies have found that there's been a lot of resiliency or not a lot of population level effects following oil spills are things like, uh, like some of the more charismatic fishes, so uh, the red drum, um, carnivorous marsh bay fishes, uh, estuarine fishes, and then lots of the little little uh, fishes. So these are Gulf killifish, sheephead mido, more of the, the fish that you don't hear about, uh, but there's lots of those in the marsh and they found to be very resilient following, following spills. And so these are species that you would expect even in, in, the, um, in the event of, of an oil spill, uh, their populations could, uh, could be weathered the storm and through that they could help support other species as well. And then there are some kind of surprises. There are some groups where they, uh, the studies show that they might be very susceptible to oil, but the food web model says that maybe they're not as important. And I, this is one, I put this one up here, there's a couple different ones, but I put this one up because it kind of surprised me. You know, there's so many grass shrimp out in, in a marsh, you'd think it's just really important. And this isn't saying they're not, it's just saying that kind of relative to some of the other species we talked about, uh, grass shrimp maybe aren't as important in the food web. There's other ways for energy to flow through the food web that can avoid a grass shrimp. Uh, and so therefore, uh, they, even if they were to have populational effects, it might not have the add-on effects that, say, uh, those uh, marsh snails might have. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, so to bring you back to those take-home messages, the approach we used here was trying to get at that understanding of uh, not just any single species, but can we look across all species, see how they are interconnected, and use that information to see how an effect by one species might propagate and affect other species. And we found that marsh fishes were those ones that were expected to do enhanced uh, resiliency in a food web following an oil spill, whereas water birds and snails, uh, and there's, there's other ones, and definitely dig into that paper if you want to. I just kind of pulled out the top ones uh, that are uh, expected to have the potential to destabilize food webs following an oil spill. So what, right? Um, it was an interesting study and you know it definitely got us thinking about things in a different way but i think the value of this research is not even in the in the exact findings i presented here but the approach i think it's a really nice way to take a look at these questions in a way that, that maybe we don't always do uh, because we're focused on individual species or or uh, or groups of organisms as opposed to looking at them all the nice thing it's also a very adaptable framework and it can help to prioritize oil spill research uh, response and restoration. So for instance, if there is one thing we found here was which species we don't really have good population level uh, data on population level effects or sensitivity. So if you go through and say, okay, which are the species that are most important in the food web, where we have a really poor understanding of their, of their uh, how sensitive they are to what that can prioritize future research, right? Maybe from a restoration standpoint, we can say, okay, well, uh, the, we found that those the snails are likely, they're very well connected in the food web, and so maybe that's a great species to be following for restoration, because once the snails are back, we know that the other organs that they're connected to are, are more likely to be supported as well. Um, so I think this approach can be very adaptable. In addition, um, this is a, a, a approach we use to look at marshes and we use to look at oil spills, but you could use the same approach to look at really any food web and any potential stressor whether it's the influence of freshwater diversions into estuarine systems, whether it's um, other contaminants, you name it. I think it's an approach that you could use. Uh, and I think this approach also gives you kind of a big picture, a bird's eye view. And now there's some pluses and minuses, right? So usually uh, when a lot of us are out doing work, we're focused on the thing we're studying. The, in this case, we're trying to catch some, some killifish. So we're gonna throw a trap out there and we kind of see this small area. Right, so we have a lot of detail. Now, uh, sometimes it's important to get that detail, but it's also important to sort of step back and get the big picture, right? And what you lose in detail, you gain in perspective. And I think an approach like this modeling approach is a way to gain some big picture perspective to really reinforce and, uh, and focus those detailed studies uh, moving forward. So. Plus it's a pretty picture, so I wanted to, to, to show you that. And that's just uh, in Bay Batiste, kind of close to Beijing area where some folks have been talking about. 
So uh, I want to thank uh, C Grants and especially Emily uh, for the invitation and, and all of y'all for, for coming. And, and definitely want to thank uh, Mike McCann, who led that effort, and the many co-authors and uh, collaborators in the, in the Coastal Water Consortium project. And uh, we are funded through Gomery, and, and there's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me there. Thank you.